We met in Nashville, Tennessee in 2005. We took the whole 10,000 hours thing very seriously and it's taken us this long to not just be eating ramen noodles and to say it's our career, which is exciting. Yeah, uh, we did meet uh, across a crowded room. We saw each other. Uh, we did just want to make out, so it took four years. Hold on real quick. We see each other across a crowded room. This was a very romantic moment. She walks towards me and I say to the person sitting next to me, that is the girl I'm gonna marry. What I forgot, when I said that, was I was sitting next to a girl I was kind of dating at the time. And so Small that, problem. So I, that, that didn't work out. And we actually saw a meme on Instagram just before we came on stage that fits perfectly with the story. It was a picture of Tom from MySpace. It says, don't forget who introduced you to your baby daddy. <laughs> First time I ever spoke to Amanda and asked her out was on MySpace. I know that yeah. kind of dates me. And I think it shows how cool I am. <laughs> so I get up to talk to Amanda at church this day. Cause I, and I honestly was only there because I was trying to hit on the girl. That, anyway, um, I'm a great guy now. I've grown. <laughs> I planned out every line I was going to say. Amanda draws close to me. She rolls her eyes. I sink back into my seat, and literally four years go by until we meet. And uh, we're introduced by a dear friend of ours. And I'm glad I had those four years to grow and develop as a person. And he, he invited me to a show. Uh, he was playing, and I actually had no idea that he sang at all, but I had secretly been stalking him for a couple years. So I said, of course I'll come to your show. So I show up, and after the show, I'm like, that was awesome. Would you write songs with me? I've been writing by myself. I'm living in New York, and I just want to get back to the root of, like, just sitting and writing a song just because you want to get something out and not because, you know, it's going to be a great pop hit and we can make you into the next Rihanna or something. And that's a lot of what I was getting. And he, All I heard was, do you want to be by yourself yeah. with me for an extended period of time? I think and I so. said, man, all I would want to do is write a song with you. Have you written a song with me, though? It takes a long time. Yeah, he brought champagne and flowers for our first writing session, which... I think that's normal. Nice touch. <laughs> so we got married in 2009. I'm, uh, I count myself the luckiest man in any room on the face of this earth because I get to do what I love most in life with the person I love most in life. And uh, she's standing right here next to me just in case there are any questions. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna talk to you a little bit about our songwriting process because it's a question that we get asked a lot um, on, on our travels. But it was a room kind of like this a couple years ago that we heard a cartoonist for The New Yorker speak. Uh, and he said a lot of people ask him what comes first, the cartoon or the punchline. And he said, neither. It's really, I imagine the look on the person's face when they open up the magazine and they see this cartoon. Like, what are they feeling? And that's where I start every time. And Abner and I immediately looked at each other and said, yeah, that's the best way to describe it for us as well. We had been failing at the question of what comes first, the lyric or the melody? Because people, they want to know. Everybody wants to get you in this little box as a song. Right? Okay, so when you write... What comes first? Because all you hear is like the guitar and the voice, so one of those has to lead the way. And we'd been failing miserably at answering a very simple question, how do you write a song, for years and years. And it wasn't until we heard him say that that we realized that even though it changes the process, the procedure is unique to every song most of the time, the one thing that's always constant is the feeling that we have. And, I, and we really think this is the magic of music, is that you get to feel something and in the next three minutes and 30 seconds, hopefully convey that feeling to the listener. They can carry that with them and make it their own. So we realize the one constant is always a feeling we want you, the listener, to have in the song that we haven't yet created. And that's the way really the song starts. And then it could be, then typically it involves her cooking and me bothering her with a guitar chord or a melody that I'm thinking of. We do our best writing in sweatpants and uh, while eating food we found, so that's another part. Which brings me to the second thing. So if the first, uh, the first thing to our songwriting is emotion and the feeling behind it. The second key factor to every song that we've written together, I think, is vodka. It's I'm just going to be story. honest with you guys. It's a true story. true story. You know, when you first write with somebody, how many songwriters do we have in the room? Do we have a lot of songwriters in the room? Any songwriters at all? We have any, a couple. Any other artists of any sort? All right, good. Yeah, we got a couple. So I'm going to lie to you all about songwriting, and you won't know any better. That's good. <laughs> when you write with somebody for the first time, you want to be real kind. I'm sure it's the same with any collaborative work. You want to be nice. You want to really make sure you use the other person's opinion and really respect it and show it the honor it deserves. When you're married to the person and you don't like something, you just tell them, I, I don't, don't like, like that. that. <laughs> I don't like that. And then you have a standoff and you stare at each other and then somebody doesn't get dinner. <laughs> And then the song doesn't get written. We realized in our first two years of marriage, we wrote two songs. 
and we were constantly writing, but we completed two songs. So uh, so we introduced vodka to the mix that helped, and we also introduced a third party, a guy named Britton Newbill, who is a, a national native as well. We all moved to L.A. around the same time, and we decided to write some songs together, and he helps us finish the songs, which uh, I think uh, any creative person at all understands that feeling of getting to like a dead end and if you don't have a deadline you just kind of put it off until you just kind of forget about it and then maybe years later you'll pick it back up so Britton uh, helped us finish it with the vodka he really did and you know it gave us a uh, marriage I like how she said uh, where love and lyrics collide it uh she likes music there's something about marriage that I learned in songwriting that if I'm if the goal of this session to write a song is to write a song then I have to be able to give up my opinion, the things, the small little nuances that I might be willing to die on that hill for that I realize retrospectively, or not even retrospectively, just in context, don't matter as much, because this is a really great song we're working on, and it counts more than whether it's if or but, because it's normally the dumbest things we argue about whenever we're writing a song together, and the same thing in marriage. I think it's been key for us to realize that we're on the same team, and there's a greater goal than figuring out who's right or wrong, even though it's normally uh, me. Her. It's her all the time. <laughs> that there's something we're rooting for that's bigger than a moment. There's something that lasts longer. And uh, in that way, music's been invaluable to us. And you know, it's funny. The, uh, as a songwriter, you realize, and I'm sure it's the same in, in creative fields throughout, that the most important thing is showing up every day. Because it's the song may happen right away, but most of the time it doesn't. For us, there's songs, some of our favorite songs we've ever written together, we've written over the period of years and years. And then there's been some songs that just kind of happen. They just kind of come out, and you're almost scared of what you said because it felt like a stream of consciousness, and the lyrics were a little too revealing. And there was one day, we were in L.A., and we were writing with our dear friend, Grey Goose, and also a guy named <laughs> Britton Newbill. And we'd spent all day trying to write an L.A. hit. Man, let's write this hit. We're in L.A. now. We had just moved there from Nashville. Let's write a pop song. Let's write something really great. They're going to play all over the place, whatever. And we'd failed miserably all day. So at the end of the day, we just started strumming some chords that reminded us of Nashville. Amanda, myself, and Britton all met in Nashville and all live in L.A. now. And we realized that uh, we just wanted something that reminded us of home. And we kind of regurgitated this song really quickly. And it's become one of our favorites. And if it's all right with you, we'd like to play it for you real quick. Is that all right? And a big shout out to XRT because they've played it for us too. XRT is one of the first radio stations in America to play this song, by the way. Chicago, 
25 years of age Say beside me was a lovely road A wanderer That's bad Okay Tools are always better than sand So she made all my plans Gave me a hand We ain't got no time for looking bad with that one so uh, so some songs we kind of uh, take the root I guess Michelangelo said it best he said um, somebody's gonna know this direct quote and so just humor me with the way that I say this but he said that every every sculpture every statue in okay I'll say it again every block of marble is already a statue and it's just his job to get it out it already exists we're just kind of excavating. And we feel the same way about songwriting, that I'm out of breath in my song. <laughs> that the best thing we can do sometimes is sit back and listen, is sit back and wait, and, uh, and excavate whatever's coming out. And we find that when we've done that, uh, A, that's been some of our favorite songs, but also the songs have gone to do further, more things, better things than we actually intended for them. Do you want to tell them about? To do. Yeah. Completely. So uh, this, this, we're going to sing one more song for you, and it's, got, it's one of my favorite songs we perform, and I love the story behind it. it, it uh, like a couple other songs we've written that are also my favorite, it was inspired by somebody that pissed us off real bad. Yeah. Made us angry. So I grew up on the west side of Jacksonville, Florida, and on the west side of Jacksonville, Florida, you don't have like a lot of big dreams. You don't count on doing much that anybody else didn't already do. And there's not a lot of great examples of people that have been songwriters on the west side of Jacksonville. So when I, at eight years old, told my friends that I was gonna grow up, move to Nashville, be a songwriter, marry a pretty girl, they thought I was crazy. They didn't realize I was psychic. <laughs> so I remember there's this one guy who was a, a great influence in my life in all other areas, but in this one particular. I remember when I turned 18, I was moving to Nashville and he handed me a quarter, and he did this with the most serious and concerned look on his face and feeling in his heart. He's like, Abner, you're gonna be homeless. <laughs> this isn't gonna work out. It didn't work out for Susie. It's not gonna work out for you. Why are you any different? Keep this quarter. Don't spend it, but one day when you find yourself on the street, find a payphone, call me, no matter where you are. 
I'll come get you. And he was so proud of himself as he said this. I was like, bro, you could suck it. This is stupid. I'm, I'm going to be all right. Fast forward a little bit. Last year, we had the privilege of having our late night television debut on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And it was uh, a momentous occasion for us, for sure. And the whole day, that whole experience was a big blur for us. On the indie record that we recorded in our glorif we call it a guest room, but it's really just like a big closet. We got to play The Tonight Show, and I remember the next day, the thing I was most excited about was this one dude. I wanted him to call me so bad. I had a whole speech ready for him. Like, Abner, I was wrong. A speech right. ready for him to say, yeah. not that he, Abner was going to give him. No, I wrote his speech yeah, to his give speech me. speech for him. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it was a good speech. Believe it or not, he did call me, and he did not rehearse the speech I had given him to recite back to me. I expected him to be like, Abner, you guys, hey, come on, man. You push through, you persevere. 20 years you've been trying to do this thing, and you're making it happen. Good for you. Something to that extent. And it did not come out that way. He said, hey, man, listen, I got some stuff I'm trying to promote. Can you just give me the email address, whoever hooked you up with Leno, what? so I can promote it on Leno? And I believe I was on speakerphone, and Amanda told him. You can suck it. We've worked for, at this point, eight years, and we got asked to do this. Just be happy for us. You know? We're 8,000 hours in, man. Yeah. We only got 2,000 left. We're almost there. We're almost experts. <laughs> so we actually did. I actually did kind of get a little bit angry with him, and then it turned into this song that we started to write. Uh, so we wrote this Suck It song, and then uh, about six months later, we went down to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, and we were like, hey why don't we try the new song we just wrote? Because it doesn't come across as angry. We could probably get away with it. Literally, the first place we ever played this angry suck it song was at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> True story. And we realized as we were singing this song for these kids whose everyday challenges far outweigh a couple douchey friends. And they were connecting with the song. Parents were connecting with the song. The kids were in a way that we did not anticipate at all. And we realized we hadn't just written a suck it song. And this, that performance, that moment forever changed the way this song, what this song means to us, what we expect when this song comes out of us. And I, it I think that was the moment that we saw what the, what the sculpture actually was beneath the block of marble. <laughs> Not quite at 10,000 hours yet. <laughs> you were saying something so great too. I'm sorry. This song went from a suck it song to a song of hope, so hopefully even here tonight, if you need some hope, you get some from it. But you've been warned at its core, this is a suck it song. It's called Diamonds. <laughs>
taken down so many others all but you can suck it cause in these ashes I'm stronger still you learn to fear my pain yeah you will you've taken down so many others oh but you'll know my name when you see that in these ashes I'm stronger still you'll learn to fear